What's up everybody? Welcome to Urban Crest Online. It is such a privilege to have you with us today. We are going to continue to go even deeper into how we got the Bible that we have. Why is it what it is? Why are the words that we use the words that we use? Why are the books that we have the books that we have? There's a lot of questions that are going to be answered today, so please make sure you open your Urban Crest app so you can follow along line by line, note by note. But before we get into that, let's prepare our hearts in worship by lifting up our voices, standing up even in your PJs in front of your bed right now, and let's sing some songs to our Lord. Are you ready? Because I'm ready. Let's go. I find my hope in you. I find my hope, my help, my power. I gotta find my peace. All in you, in Christ alone. Thank you. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter.
Hi, church family. We're here in our church parking lot with a ministry called Farmers to Families. We have three more weeks of this ministry, and it's a ministry that we're getting to give 30 pounds of fresh food to families in this area, and we're working with the government to do it, and we get to share the gospel. So will you please pray with me today? As we um, are sharing with folks, as they come through, we get to pray with them and we get to feed actual families in our community. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, we just ask that your word would be shown through all of this, that your gospel would be known, that you would bless the volunteers here and that you would be Lord of it all and that people would come to know you through this and that those who are hungry would be fed. Lord, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, Urban Crest Baptist Church, 2 Peter chapter 1. Open your Bible there. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week as we're talking about how we got the Bible. And in Peter's uh, discourse to us and teaching to us, he gives us some of the most uh, um, valuable information we could possibly hope for. He was not only an eyewitness of the, of the majesty of Christ, but he heard the confirmation from God the Father. So in verse... Uh, starting verse 16, we'll begin reading, Therefore we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, and whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, which is where we're going to pick up the negative interpretation of Scripture, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy, the, the positive, never came by the will of man. Or, I'm sorry, that continues. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So understanding, we have the negative origin. It did not come from private interpretation. We have the positive. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's where the understanding of languages is so important. It's why you pay me as a pastor and as a teacher. A superficial reading of verse 20 suggests that the verse is speaking of interpretation. That's the word that is translated from the Greek. But please note, in the language, the issue is not interpretation, but origin. How do you know that, Pastor? Because this Greek noun is a genitive of source. Not interpretation, but it's of source. So no, nothing came from its own private origin. All right, no private interpretation. That's what the scripture is trying to teach to you. The origin of scripture is one of the very first things every believer should understand in regard to the word of God. So let me kind of give it to you in uh, Tom Pendergrass vernacular. Knowing this first, no prophecy of scripture originates from anyone's own private disclosure. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but in direct opposite, the Greek word Allah, getting your attention, Allah. In direct opposite, holy men of God spoke as they were carried along. Now get this, the word move there is a present passive participle in the Greek language, which means they were continually carried and moved by the Holy Spirit. That's why we know the word of God is infallible. So Paul wrote the Timothy in chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by God, for, or is, is, all scripture is given by inspiration from God. So you want the origin? From God. That's the source. That's your genitive of source. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction and in righteousness. So I give, I shared that in devotion. I preached on it one time, but I'm going to remind you again. Doctrine is the mind of Christ. It is the subject of grace from Genesis to Revelation. It's the subject of the second coming from Genesis to the Revelation. It's the subject of justification from Genesis to Revelation. It's the totality of Scripture that is the mind of Christ. It's the sum total of the viewpoint of life. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, Your thoughts are not my thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So nobody dream this up. The Bible comes from the mind of Christ. It is Its origin is from God itself. And therefore, it should become the basis for everyday living while we're on this planet. So again, using the terminology of a path, doctrine shows us the path we're supposed to walk on. Reproof, when you study the Bible and hear it taught, you are, listen, here's what happens to me. I'm often reproved. It shows me where I get off the path. Correction, reproof always leads to it because the Bible's not going to convict me without helping to correct me. So correction comes along. Reproof should always lead to correction. Biblical correction leads to peace, rest, and ultimately happiness. It's not about guilt. Biblical correction, isn't. it's about grace. And it shows you how to get back on the path. And then instruction in righteousness, this involves the entire scope of gospel and demonstrates how God can take a sinner and make him righteous through the work of Jesus Christ alone. That's the beauty of instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness shows me how to stay on the path. The path doctrine, get off the path reproof, on the path correction, how do I stay on it? Instruction in righteousness. And Paul, again, writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, said this, that the man of God, referring to the word of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You want some go a little deeper? The word thoroughly furnished there in the Greek language is in perfect tense. Here's what it means. Furnished in the past with the results that you keep on being furnished. That's what God's word does for you. It gets you perfect, thoroughly furnished. It's completely adequate. So what it did in your past, that word will sustain you for all of eternity. Now, let's hit chapter two, first three verses, and get some more clarity from Peter. And he's going to talk about false teachers. Chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to break them down almost word by word. But therefore, or but there will also, uh, we're also, I'll get my tongue untied in a moment. There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, because this is powerful language, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And tragically, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed by covetousness. They will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment's not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. God just says, listen, you understand who they are, these false teachers. I'll take care of them. Uh, Boy, can you imagine one day standing before Jesus as a false prophet who has led maybe millions into an eternal flame? Good Lord Almighty, I don't even want to think about that. So Peter starts out and says, listen, they brought in destructive heresies. Destructive speaks of utter ruin. The final and eternal condemnation of the wicked heresies are an opinion, and listen, especially a self-willed opinion, which is substituted for submission to the power of the word of God and truth. And it leads to division. It leads to the formation of sects and cults. And God says, listen, 
That's what they're bringing to you. They are bringing to you eternal division and destruction. Even denying underscores the unthinkable magnitude of a false teeter, teacher's arrogance where the false teacher has blatantly refused and has firmly said no to the truth of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, and the free pardon of sin by grace alone, through faith alone, through the blood of Christ alone. Jesus said, listen, there are two roads out there. One of them is a very, very broad road, leads to destruction, and bucket loads of people are on it. There's another road out there. It's a very narrow road, and few will be that find it. Most people in the world stumble over grace because they cannot accept a free gift from Almighty God. Listen, friend, stop trying to work and impress God and rest in Him. I will give you rest. So as we go on, he even suggests here, and listen by his wording, even denying the Lord, please note, who bought them. It's not that false teachers couldn't be saved. It's not that they didn't know that they could be saved. They denied his power to purchase their soul. And many will follow their destructive ways. Sensuality is a strong word referring to habitual sexual immorality and an unrestrained debauched conduct. Please note, by using this noun, Peter demonstrates it's that their sexual lewdness, the destructive ways, is sexual, even perversion. Sensuality is a distinguishing mark of a spiritual counterfeit. And then, man, he goes to the word covetousness, the term for greed, which connotes an uncontrolled, covetous, covetous desire for money and wealth, and he says he will exploit you doing that. They will realize gain from your loss, and they will use deceptive words. Please don't miss this one. Deceptive comes from what our Greek word, the Greek word plastos, where we get the English word plastic. Their words are but plastic words, and when they're, when you stand upon them, they crumble and they crack. Man, Peter says, don't get deceived by that. Don't get caught up by that. Remember, the height of religion, what does religion do at its worst? It tells you who's in and who's out. Jesus says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So when a religion looks at you and said, I can tell you, you either get to go or you don't get to go. Friend, only God's word can tell you that. And only the Holy Spirit can confirm in your life that you don't know Jesus as Savior and you need him. But friend, no man ever decides your eternal destiny. Only one man did. And he's, he was perfect. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he votes in your favor. He votes for you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have the love that he expresses to you. That's good preaching. Now, why then do we need a Bible? Why do we need a canon of scripture? Why do we need a measuring stick? Number one, so that believers in every generation might have the complete revelation from God. Number two, a canon was necessary so that people might have God's word in writing for you and I, the mind of Christ. Number three, there was a need not only for that, but for the preservation and the circulation of the sacred writings of Scripture. So not only was it to be preserved, but it was to be circulated and go all over the world so that people could be exposed to the truth. Listen to what Pete says here. Please hear it again. And we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. That's what God's word does. God's word goes into the blackest holes of darkness and shines light on it and says, there's hope. And so preserving God's word 
but circulating God's words. And then fourthly, so that people would know and would understand which writings are canonical and which are not, which are part of God's word and which are not a part of God's word. So was there a criteria used? Absolutely. So let's talk about it. The criteria for the Old Testament and the canon of scriptures, what was it? Number one, the question was always of inspiration and origin. Who, who was there? Was all of the author? Who was it? Were they a recognized prophet? All of those kind of different things went into the origin of where it came from, not only divinely from an origin. Give me an example. Moses right, wrote the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bibles, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses wasn't around in Genesis. <laughs> But its origin came from God and Moses penned it. And so we can trust Moses because of his reputation of who he was in God. And we can trust because it came from God. Then there is the principle of internal evidence. Does the internal evidence support that it is God's word? Is it accurate? Is it correct? It has to be free of errors. Historically, I mean, um, persons of history, geographically, all of those things. If it speaks on science, it has to be scientifically accurate. If it talks about history, it has to be historically accurate. It, it's just incredible. And that's why we have the uh, 66 books of the New Testament given to you and I because they all pass these tests. Now, listen, also the documentation of quotation. Every book of the Old Testament was quoted in the New Testament. It has to be it had, it had to be quoted by Jesus, one of the apostles. There was it's so understanding when the Old Testament was being put together. One of its validities of being the Old Testament was how many times it was quoted by Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus said on the road to Emmaus, beginning at Moses and the Law, he began to instruct them in things of righteousness. He confirmed. Everything that they wrote down so we can trust it. The law of public official action. People understood that these were books of God and they took action to protect them. The cause of law and effect. Did, did these books change lives? Did they have the power to change lives? And then the principle of external evidence. Externally, everything proves the validity of the writings. By the year 425 BC, before Christ, all of the Old Testament books had been written and the Old Testament was collected and it was closed. Remember, after the book of Malachi, which ends with the word cursed for over 400 years, God went off the air. He didn't communicate to anybody through angels, through judges, through prophets, through teachers, nothing. So 425 years, the Testament was closed. This was also confirmed and attested by Josephus in his book Contra Appion, written to refute the heretic Appion. Now listen, what you got to understand, please don't miss this. Josephus was a Roman historian who was absolute pagan. He did not believe in Jesus, the Jews, the Bible, nothing. But he recorded accurately history as it was unfolding. So he's not writing from a biased Christianity point. We don't even know if he was agnostic. The guy was not a believer. And yet Josephus, listen to what he records. He records the sacred books of the Jews, as he calls them. He states that they were written, that the that the time during which these books were written extended from Moses to Artaxerxes I, who reigned from 465 to 424 BC. Furthermore, he demonstrates that there never, there never was a time that the Jews did not accept the Old Testament text as the word of God. Canonicity was, in fact, he states, a definite part of Jewish history. He further states that nothing was ever added to the canon, the Old Testament, 
Books after the death of Artaxerxes in 425 BC, the line of prophets had ceased to exist. No one dared make an addition, subtraction, or alteration to the canon of scriptures. That's from a lost Jewish historian. So just let that sink in, or lost Roman historian. I said Jewish. So let it sink in for a moment. Here's an external source who's not even a believer in God, who's writing the Jews' history as it unfolds. It's an incredible, incredible thing. Then um, the seventh thing, the way we test the validity of the Old Testament was for the demand for the Septuagint. Uh, the word Septuagint is a number. It means 70. That's all it means. Referring to the translators who worked on it. They translated the Old Testament Hebrew and Aramaic into New Testament Koine Greek. So the Old Testament became the Old Testament in Koine Greek. That's the Septuagint. So when you hear it, it's just a number. It's 70 because how many guys worked on it? But the demand for it then helped the um, modern day people who did not speak Hebrew that spoke a common language, they could also understand the Old Testament, learn from it and from its teachings. Beautiful thing. Now, this leads us to the rejection of the Apocrypha, and it'll probably take us through the end of this sermon right here. A um, couple statements about the Apocrypha, and then we'll define what it is. First of all, the Apocrypha has not only been uh, endorsed, uh, it has been adopted by uh, the Roman Catholic Church. So we have to understand that. The Catholic Church, if you don't know what the word Catholic means, means common. So it became known as the common church. They tried to put everybody together and have a common liturgy and a common taking of the Lord's Supper and tragically a common false doctrine and false error. So the Catholic Church, which believes, are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm going to go slow. So because people are going to think I'm Catholic bashing. I'm teaching what Catholics teach. The Catholic Church, which believes that the Pope is infallible and does not sin. Are you listening? He's infallible, and he does not sin. He has the right to insert teachings into their doctrine. And so he inserted teachings now. A string of Catholic popes have inserted teachings taken from the Apocrypha and giving them, given them divine authorization. So that's just a little bit of background. And so the Pope has the right to add to and take away from Holy Scripture. Remember when John penned Revelation, the very last chapter? Anyone that adds to or take away the writing of this book, add to the plagues and the punishments is coming. But they're teaching. He is divinely inspired and he is infallible. He does not sin. That gives him the authority. So over the years, different Non-biblical teachings were added, endorsed, and canonized by a variety of books. So the Apocrypha are books which were written after the canon of Scripture closed in 425 B.C. Okay, Josephus doesn't even recognize them. He will tell you everything added has, has been added by spurious writers, period. Okay, so it's again, lost Roman. So it's not me telling you it. It's history telling you from a lost standpoint. All right. So although asserted to be a part of God's word, the Bible or their Bible, these books were rejected as spurious, fraudulent, and definitely not a part of God's word. As a matter of fact, the principles of canonicity, are you listening, were reviewed when the Apocrypha was introduced, those seven, eight principles, all you were used to judge the Apocrypha. And by that standard, they were completely, all 14 books rejected in total. No debate. There wasn't even discussion about them. They were so bad. I mentioned it. The Apocrypha contains 14 books, which are found in the Septuagint. Remember, that was the Greek translation hundreds of years later. 
they, they did place them there and in what's called the Vulcan, but never found in the Hebrew canon of Scripture, ever. So they were added later on when the Septuagint was translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. They added these into a part of what we would now call the Catholic or common Bible. Okay. Um, they were originally written in the Greek language, except for Ecclesiasticus. That's a big word. First Maccabees, part of Baruch, Judith and Tobith. Those were uh, written in Aramaic. And again, they were all rejected. So let me walk you through systematically. Number one, the Apocrypha was never included in the Hebrew canon of Scripture, ever. That was clear from history. Number two, please get what I'm going to say. Neither Jesus Christ nor any New Testament writer ever quoted from the Apocrypha, ever. Okay, number three, Josephus expressly excluded them from his list of sacred books in Scripture from the Jewish nation. Number four, no mention of the Apocrypha was made in any catalog of canonical books from in the first 400 centuries A.D. Not one. So all of your church writers, all of your church, uh, early church fathers, Never mentioned them, ever quoted them, or wrote them. Am I good? Number five, these apocryphal books were never asserted to be divinely inspired or to possess divine authority in their contents. Number six, no prophets were connected with these writings. Not one. They didn't talk about Moses. They didn't talk about Abraham, David. Not one. Okay? These books contained multiple, many historical, geographical, and chronological errors. On that basis alone, all 14 books were eliminated, just on that one standard alone. The Apocrypha teaches doctrines and upholds practices which are completely contrary to the canon of Scripture, the Bible, and are evil. Now, let's take three or four of them. And we're going to stop. We'll pick the rest of them up in next week's sermon. Uh, prayers. First one. Prayers and offerings for the dead were caught, taught in Second Maccabees. It is a holy and wholesome thing to pray for the dead that they may become loosed from their sins. Second Maccabees 12, 46. You find that refuted throughout the other 66 books of the Bible. Is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Secondly, 2 Maccabees chapter 14, verses 41 through 46, suicide is justified, and it's called a noble death. God help us. Number three, atonement and salvation can be accomplished by giving alms. That's giving money. Ecclesiastes 3, 33 and Tobit 4, 11. For alms deliver from all sin and from death and will not suffer the soul to go into darkness. You are you beginning to understand where some of this garbage comes that's being taught today? Number four, in Ecclesiastes chapter 33, verses 25 through 29, cruelty to slaves was justified. They're less, they're subhuman beings. Kind of like what when we studied the book of Corinthians, people that Corinthians had a bronze mine that they were famous for there. And they had what they called human moles, people who were born underground and never came above ground, died underground as slaves. Paul will call reference to a few of them as he's calling their names out. And he's writing names of salutation, quartress and tertress. Those are numbers. These people don't even have a name. God knows their name, but he's saying here cruelty is justified there. The doctrine of emanations comes from the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 25. The pre-existence of souls before deity in the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 8, 19 and 20. Other fallacies that we'll pick up next week. We'll There's six or seven more, and I don't have time to cover them. 
See, what I want to make sure we understand is when we say something's wrong, we know why it's wrong. When we say something is evil, we know why something's evil. Friend, I'm telling you, Jesus loves you today, and he paid your death in totality. There's not enough money you could give to buy your soul. Listen to what the word says. Listen, you know yourself, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but you were bought, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Do not blaspheme the holy blood of Jesus Christ by thinking there's another way to get around it. You have to come to that cross and ask Jesus Christ to take that shed blood that, that was shed for you on Calvary and cover you and your sins with that precious blood. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Don't let anybody tell you who's in, who's out. Jesus wants you to be in. But when you die, it'll be Jesus that says, you're out because you're going to stand before him one day and Jesus will say, listen, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. I never knew you. Give your life to Jesus today. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you. We can study and we know what truth is and that truth sets us free. Save today. I pray people will turn to you today. Jesus, they will turn to you and say yes. And we who maybe have walked away will come home today and start that fresh walk with you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you responded today, go to that card, go online, respond to us. If we can pray for you, if we can help you, please let us know. We love you. In Jesus' name, God bless. Thank you, Pastor, for that powerful word. Man, I am having a great time learning how we got to the Bible that we've got now. But you guys, you know it's time to give some appreciation, some honor to our pastor, our fearless leader, as he continues to uh, you know, bring it every week. So in the comments right now, just express a little love. Love you, Pastor Tom. Thank you so much. Good preaching. You go, boy. Let's go. Put it in the comments right now. Well, thank you for doing that, family. I know he is encouraged every week by your positive comments. So at this point in the service, we wanted to offer you the opportunity to give. And usually I like to encourage you with what your generosity is doing around the world, but today I wanna to show you a little bit of what your generosity can do right now. At this time of the year, every year, we start packing boxes and getting our resources together to support Operation Christmas Child. That's a beautiful ministry 
done by Samaritan's Purse. And their goal is to show God's love in a tangible way to children in need all around the world. Now, it's such a near and dear ministry to our hearts that I would love to give you all of the information right now, but instead of me just talking at you, I wanna show you. So please take a look at this video. This year has been a pandemic year. Children are hurting all over the world. People are afraid, families are scared. People have lost their jobs. They don't know where to go, what to do. They don't know what hope they have for the future. Well, I want every child to know that God loves them, that God has not forgotten them, and that He cares for them very much. And when you pack a shoebox and send it to Operation Christmas Child, it gives us an opportunity to give that box to a child and do it in Jesus' name. Can you just imagine the hope and the thrill and the joy of when a kid opens up a lid like this and all these toys are in it? It's an incredible gift. And so I just want to say thank you. We need your help this year more than we've ever needed it because of the pandemic. It's just gonna create a lot more opportunity. Thank you and God bless you. And remember, pray for the children of the world. Wow, what an amazing ministry and what a way to serve. And the great thing is, you don't even have to be where we are here in Lebanon, Ohio. Wherever you are, if you wanna pack a shoebox, you can use the links in your chat below to find your location or the location nearest you so you can drop off your one, two, 10, 20, 100 shoeboxes, whatever the Lord leads you to do. And if you can't do that, then you can always give as the Lord asks you to give. Um, so you can see all of the stuff down there that you see that, yeah, you can do any of those things. <laughs> so God bless you as you are making those very important decisions. Now church, it's time to go. And while I hate to see you go, I am so excited that you will be back here again next week. It's been awesome to have you. Now in the meantime, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you can become a part of our notification squad and know when we are online doing the cool things that we get to do. So uh, for now, bye. We'll see you next time. God bless you.